your totem poles, your carvings, I feel kind of ground this place. They are just boom. It was always, you know, pretty cool to do this because Rolf Hop comes up with these ideas and I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> he was so incredibly engaged and it's really his calling to carve. Once we saw that, um, it was amazing. And welcome, Gwe. This is the Friends United International Convention Center in Unamagi, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks so much for joining us for the second annual Friends United Reconciliation Talks. I am so happy and thrilled today to be joined by Jerry Sheena, an artist and man about town, and Rolf Bowman, who is the spine of this place and, and who conceived of this amazing project, Friends United. Welcome to you both. Hello. Thank you very much. This is the house of Rolf. You should really be no, starting. No, 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 please. No, 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 no. No, it's the house of artists. everyone. That's your magic. Please, that's the case. It's just a building. I mean, if you take the artwork out of it, 43 artists, there's nothing left. So it's just a house, but the artwork is what makes it so special, right? Beautiful. Um, Jerry, I said to you today that your totem poles, your carvings, I feel kind of ground this place. When I, when I look around, it's like they are just, boom, grounding it. Tell me how you got involved with Friends United. I got involved um, through a friend um, and, a, and a, also an artist here, Jason Adair. He, um, he was here at the time and I was, I was on the West Coast and he called me out of the blue and told me about Ralph, and he said, yeah, Ralph. Uh... Well, first of all, he told me about Friends United long before, so I didn't really, you know, it wasn't a surprise that I, he called me from there, and then he said, uh, oh yeah, Ralph wants to meet you. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Who, me? Yeah, right? Anyway, so yeah, I spoke with him on the phone briefly, and uh, I got an immediate invite, and uh, I think it was like a week later I was here, something like that. So were you very trusting? I know, I always remember J. Bell Redbird telling me that when he first met Rolf, he was like, okay, come on, is this guy for real? And a lot of artists have said that, that was their first reaction. Yeah, um, honestly, uh, Jason told me a lot about Rolf before, so it was kind of like I, I had a good feeling about him. Um, yeah, so I, w I was really excited to actually come check and it out. Do you remember how it felt the first time you walked into the center? Yeah, totally like it was yesterday. It was, I was in awe. I was like, wow. Like, even still to, the, to this day, I can wander around here and still be in awe. Yeah. Mm. It makes me emotional every time I walk in the front door. Yeah, right. It's like the energy hits you. Like the beauty hits you, but the energy also just about knocks it's you down. It's a powerful place for sure. Yeah, it is. Rolf, tell me your side of your, of your bromance. <laughs> oh, there's so many things to that. Um, I always had looked for a First Nation person who could do totem poles. And on the East Coast, that's traditionally not something that was done. So we really had to go to the West Coast. Jason came here, Jason Adair. He talked about Jerry, he showed me on the phone some artwork he'd done. I said, we gotta, we gotta call this guy. So we called him and I think Jerry wanted to come. And funny enough, about two weeks before that, we had, we had cut two big trees, two big pine trees next to a power line. They were going to fall on the power line. So we really had no choice. And they were 150 years old or so. 
So uh, I said, listen, Jerry, um, we already have some trees and he saw them and he loved them. And then, of course, for us, it became over the next few weeks and months because he came many times. Such an incredible journey of creativity, of learning, of mentorship. He was so incredibly engaged and it's really his calling to carve. Once we saw that, um, it was amazing. And so these were the first, actually did one totem pole. When I came back from Germany from a business trip, I saw it and was amazed. And we had the other one, which then led to another kind of assembly where he had two totem poles on the left and right and one on top, a really long one. I talked about the seven sacred teachings. Anyways, I will let Jerry talk about that totem pole. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Jerry, you want to take the ball and run with it on that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> anyway, when I first met Ralph, came here, checked it all out. He had uh, this one log, it was what, 11 feet, I think. The one that here. was a small one outside, yes. Yeah, so we did a story pole. So if you read, somebody carefully wrote out the story about that pole. Um, and then I think I was here for three weeks. And then, uh, so I went back to the West Coast, but before we left, that's when we went to this one property he had and there was this big, huge pine tree, it was huge. We dropped it. Well, first we did a little blessing. We blessed the tree, we dropped it. <clears throat> And uh, his his uh, his his log cutters cut it up nicely to to our specs, and uh, and then I believe came back after that, or did you came back? You have come so many times. Yeah. Absolutely. So yes. then I came back. We we shaped it out, and then I left again. So I was here for a bit. We shaped it out, and it was uh, yeah. It was always you know pretty cool to do this because Rolfstop comes up with these ideas, and I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this one was uh, an archway kind of thing for, for the big meeting room. And uh, yeah, we decided to do the seven sacred teachings because in the, in the meeting room, there's the words of all the, of the seven sacred teachings. And I just, the idea came and let's do it that way. So. Is that the one that's over the table? Yes. Oh my gosh, it's amazing, really. So let's talk about how the process works, Rolf. When you bring an artist here, how do you support them? What does that look like? It's really different for everybody. People have different needs, different thoughts, different ideas. In Jerry's case, we knew pretty quickly he wanted to come back, which really meant we had to have a workshop. So we had to kind of convert a big garage into a workshop, which really worked out okay. We got more and more tools. He brought some tools also from BC. And then he's been here five, six, seven times, sometimes for six months or longer. And uh, it's different really for every artist. Obviously, when you paint, then you need more canvas and paints and whatnot. And in Jerry's case, something was very different, very positive different. He said one day, look, Rolf, um, I don't mean to offend you, but we actually have real trees in Nova Scotia. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, like big trees. I said, well, yeah, I gave you 350 years. I said, no, that's not a big tree. He said, something really big. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, I'm from British Columbia. We have big trees. I said, okay. Um, I heard it and I seen some photos. I said, well, that's a lumber yard in Surrey and there's two big logs scheduled to be cut up sometime for something likely, I don't know, shingles or, or boards or something. And he said, can we save those logs and do something with totem poles? And I said, uh, maybe. So I didn't know what it entailed. And I called this gentleman up. Um, I think it was called Duncan Chisholm, yeah. interesting enough, yeah. in the lumber yard. And he said, listen, that's the name here from Nova Scotia. And Duncan said, yeah, by the way, I'm from Nova Scotia, or at least my ancestors are. I come from Antigonish, what's that like? So I explained to him what Antigonish looked like. And I said, listen, Duncan, you have two logs in the lumber yard. Can I buy them? And he said, oh, those ones, yes, yes. He said, well, uh, yeah. I said, how much are they? He said, I don't know. I said, well, it can't be that difficult to tell me the price of two logs. And he said, well, yeah, you know, it's so many cubic yards and cubic meters, and I have to call you back tomorrow. And I said, oh. So he called me back the next day and he said, you can buy those logs for $22,000. I said, uh, Duncan, I didn't want to buy your lumber yard. I just want to buy, buy, buy two <laughs> logs, right? Say, holy <laughs> Hannah. 
Um, so we said, well, look, Ralph, honestly, if we cut them up for boards, it's, it's uh, red cedar and it's in perfect shape. That's really what I'm going to get. I'm happy to send them to you for totem poles, but understand, please, that's the price for them. So I spoke to Jerry and I said, Jerry, um, one, that's a lot of money, but two, do you kind of understand this is the other coast, 6,000 kilometers, I'm not going to fly here. He said, yeah, we have to talk to some trucking companies and we did. So another $11,000 beyond that, $33,000, we had two logs here. And that was a lot of money, more money than we ever had given to an artist, especially for something to start for materials. It's one thing to pay for canvas and, and, and paints, but that was a big thing. However, his point was, look, one, we can save those logs forever and do something worthwhile with them. And number two, it's telling history. I mean, we don't have this anywhere in Canada to this degree. Um, so the two big logs came from the West Coast. I think the truck could only load two logs and it was full. That was six or seven days. We have photos actually. And well, then Jerry came with a big chainsaw. I mean, a really big chainsaw. Anyways, you can tell you about the rest, I think. Yeah. How exciting is it as an artist to look? It's like, I guess it's like someone doing a mural who loves to paint. It's like this huge opportunity. Yeah, a big time. I mean, of course, I was surprised that Rolf pulled the trigger on it, right? Just because I know it's a lot to ask. And, and I basically just tried to tell him, like, look, you know, you've got some beautiful stuff here. And you want to represent the West Coast. It has to be authentic. I said, these, you know, poles out of pine are beautiful and stuff, but it's not authentic, you know, so. I guess, yeah, when he pulled the trigger, it was, yeah, I was like, okay, ooh, this is happening. And when we started seeing them being loaded on this big truck, I'm like, wow, this is happening. And then when they showed up here, it was like, wow, this is definitely happening. <laughs> that is real. Yeah. It is real. Yeah. It's it's interesting because this is a part of, of his support of artists, yes. buying the materials and providing them and so on. How else would you describe um, the way Rolf supports artists here? Um, words cannot describe, honestly. I mean, I've been in this business going on 40 years, and he's a rare gem. He's as rare as some of these trees, you know. The, I was in awe. I still am in awe. And I, I, We do it together, brother, okay? I'm uh, so appreciative, I'm grateful and honored to be here working with Ralph and what he represents. Um, it's big. It's, um, yeah, it's something an artist dreams of probably his whole career, you know what I mean? And it's coming true, so. Yeah, it seems profound to have the time and the space to do your work without worrying about paying rent or buying food or any of that stuff. Exactly. It's huge. Like, it's a dream. Yeah. yeah. And your creativity, how, how is it impacted by having that sort of headspace? Well, <clears throat> honestly, yeah. I mean, being in the, the city most of my career, you know, you're always... Uh, faced with deadlines and, and uh, you know, the hustle, the bustle. Uh, it's, it's way different here. Here you take a step back in time and it's like, uh, I think it's more like the way it was in the old days, you know, where there was no deadline. You know, Rolf doesn't breathe down your back. You know, he doesn't, you know you know, crack a whip or anything. And, you know, there's just zero pressure. And yeah, it's like every artist's dream, zero pressure. Awesome. Rolf, you are used to hearing that kind of gratitude from artists, I know. Well, it's um, kind of difficult for me always to hear because while it's certainly true, I can never understand why not anybody else has done this before. So many government projects start and they fall apart the minute the funding dries up. That's why I always said we'll never be government funded. We do this in small steps, baby steps, but at least I know this way what we can promise we can keep and we can have a long-term sustainability 
in this whole project. That's really important. And again, the artists do different things all the time. I'm so grateful to Jerry. He brings other artists on board. We do things together. And um, Friends United is really when the artists steer us where to go, they kind of tell us where to go. Sure, we all sometimes have to make decisions and together in the end, but often I sit down with each artist, say, where would you like to go? Where do you come from? Where are you? Where would you like to go? How can we help? And it's a, it's a really great experience. If I think for future generations, they can look at these totem poles here. Red Cedar lasts a long time as it is, but my point being is, it's the energy also, and um, Jerry knows this, and I think, I think you know it also. Many artists over the years passed away, so we have the legacy of their life here, and this is important to me. We had this week, then Christmas here, Duse, his wife was here, helped a great deal in mentorship, in terms of mentorship and um, painting. Jaber Redbird, my also dear friend and brother, passed away. He would have mentored so many other artists here. Gordon Fiddler passed the way you painted. Um, Sandra Simon, who's from Bucking Cactus Cool Basket, she passed away. But when you come to the center, you can always see the legacy. And when the families come in here, you see their face light up because it's it's a memory of what was, but yet a guide for future generations what could be and can be. I guess we can't call it that. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful way to put it. Uh, Kerry Prosper talked about his friend Sandra Simon and saying how he watched her sense of herself and her self-esteem grow as she was learning and, and supported. And then when she had her baskets, her quill baskets displayed here, he said he just saw her blossom, basically. Do you, do you see that with other people and do you feel it yourself, Jerry? Um, yeah, um, it's not often you get to continuously see the piece you created because most times it's dealt through a gallery, you know, the, the people buy it, they take it and it's never seen again. So it's rare that you come to a place and get to work at a place and meet other artists and continuously see the piece you make. So you can learn from it and continuously learn from it and. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Very cool. Tell me, go back and tell me your story, if you don't mind. My story? Yeah. Start at the beginning, start wherever you like. Um, <clears throat> well, I guess it all started back when I was, anyway, I was in, in, in elementary school, high school, and I never knew anything about my First Nations culture or any First Nations culture. I was mainstream with all the other the other kids and you know, I played hockey, you know, just did normal stuff, you know, chase squirrels and stuff, you know. <laughs> normal stuff, sounds um, like high school. Yeah, right. And then uh, <clears throat> it wasn't until after high school, I went to this uh, education place called the Native Ed Center and uh, I was planning to go, you know, college full time. So they had a program. It was called the College Prep Program. And um, one of the classes was the Social Studies. And the instructor there, his name—I forget his name, unfortunately—but um, he wasn't even a native dude. He was a white guy, and um, he opened my eyes to First Nations culture and what had happened, you know, with the, everything, you know, like it was just a real eye opener. So I was like, wow, this is crazy. And then I went to college, but my initiation, my initial goal was to be a businessman. I wanted to be a businessman. I wanted to open my own galleries and sell the art that all, everyone was creating. But because when you go to college, you have to have a high GPA to choose the class you want. I didn't have that. So I had to take what was basically left over. So I took a lot of just normal stuff like psychology and like calculus, and English grammar, whatever, just classes that 
weren't getting me anywhere I wanted to be. So I, I decided to take this uh, program called NITEP. It's a native uh, Indian teacher education program. So I thought, well, oh, I'll be a teacher. You know, that'd be cool. So anyway, I was two years deep into that. And of course, the only thing I ever really got an A in my whole school career was, was art. And, you know, so I was sitting in the back of class while these long lectures were going on. And, and I wasn't really paying attention. I was just kind of, there was this chunk of plaster scene in the back of the class. I found it and started like sculpting these little um, maquettes and stuff. And, and uh, some of my colleagues were like, what are you doing, Jerry? And I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm listening here. Yeah. Oh, they're like, yeah, you're right. You're not listening. So they're like, you should, you know, maybe think about going to art school. I'm like, no, no, I can't do that. I'm going to be a teacher. <laughs> you thought you had to take a traditional path. Yeah. yeah you know, something that had some bite. Some... <laughs> but <clears throat> anyway, my, my uh, counselor in, in where, I was, where I was living, well, from my hometown, who sponsored me to go to school. She goes, uh, I was telling her about, you know, like how I was having a hard time, you know, finding any kind of grip on this educational thing. And she's like, well, she goes, um, I know you want to be an artist, but, you know, she goes, I'll introduce you to this guy. She goes, his name's Opie Oppenheim. And he was our local artist. He was infamous and and uh, so he, she set up a meeting and I went with him and he showed, showed me his studio. He had the, like this giant studio and he was a silk screener, you know, and he did, um, he did woodland style prints and stuff. And uh, after I'd met him, I start seeing his work everywhere. And I'm like, oh yeah. And he's like, he goes, so this is just, you know, I just want you to see that, you know, if you wanted to be an artist, which I'm hearing, he goes, I just want you to know you can make a living because of, I was in doubt because I thought, you know, like, how am I going to make a living at art? You know, like, mm -hmm. I want to be somebody. I don't want to be broke, you know, because that starving artist thing was in my head. Not so appealing. Exactly. <laughs> wasn't so appealing. So anyway, so I go to art school. I'm a couple of years at uh, Langara, a couple of years at Emily Carr, an infamous art school. But again, I wasn't really learning what I wanted. There were, the First Nations culture, the carving aspect of it all was, was which was calling me because when I was a kid, I used to go out with my brother to sell his art and I would go in these galleries and it was, they were like much like this. They were big and with like three dimensional totem poles and masks and stuff and everything. And I like, wow, I would look up and I would say to myself, I wish I could do that. Mm -hmm. I love the way you present it as a calling to you. Yeah, and I think uh, it shows me. That's why, you know, I, I was busy trying to be something I wasn't meant to be, I think. And so <clears throat> the one day after my mom had got real sick and uh, she was in a hospital, looked like she was on her deathbed. So <clears throat> I'd, I'd, I'd left school. I, I went to go be with her and... I was gone a substantial amount of time and I'd missed all these, as usual, all the like exams and stuff. So when I went back, you know, I said, well, can I redo these exams? And they're like, oh yeah, sure you can, but you'll have to pay a whole fee again, you know, the, the student fee. And I'm like, you know, I didn't have seven, 800 bucks. So I just said, you know, I'll see you guys later. <laughs> so I just left. And then I went to my brother. I said, you know, brother, you know, go teach me how to carve. So he was a carver already? Yeah, he was a carver, but he only carved like two-dimensional stuff. Uh -huh. That's why when I, you know, like I, I loved his work, everything about it and everything, but it was when I went to the gallery, I was like the three-dimensional stuff that was grabbing me and I was like in awe of. So anyway, <clears throat> his only advice to me was, uh, just get yourself some tools and do it. I'm like, okay. So that's what I did. I got some tools. Uh, my bro my brother in law, who was also a carver, knew a toolmaker, <clears throat> and uh, I think it was like a day or two later I was put in my order, and then a few days later I had my tools, so I just started doing it, and that's it. You know, like I couldn't find a teacher, I couldn't find anyone that really helped me excel, because I already knew what w wood, I knew the wood grain, I knew, you know. 
oh, everything I needed to know about what to, to attack it and carve it and shape it, but I had no guidance on where to go from there. So you felt like an intuitive understanding of how to do it, but you lacked uh, instructions. Exactly. I didn't have any, like, um, in, in the West Coast, there's these different form lines. There's like the Haida form line. There's a Kauai Gilth form line. There's a Northern, like a Kitsan style form line. They're all unique, but they're, you know, there's a, a certain respect you have to pay to that 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 um, style, you can't just go and make up your own, you know what I mean? So a form line is a, a, the style of carving? Correct. Is that what it is? Yes. So Jerry, you ran into a bump in your life at some point. Tell me how, what happened and, and how that influenced your art. Yeah, um, okay, there was, <clears throat> I was probably already, I don't know, a few years deep in my career where I'd, I'd uh, uh, started, you know, hanging out with probably some guys that were half my age, and and I guess I was, you know, still trying to hang on to my youth. I guess some people would say. So of course, you know, hanging out with guys half your age comes partying and gambling and stuff like that, and then uh, of course the drinking and the and the the drugs came out. And of course, all the time in the beginning, it's always fun, you know. And then, um, then the drugs take over. I mean, I was always never, I was never real heavy on the drinking. I could drink, but it was the drugs that really got me. And then, before you knew it, <clears throat> I was yeah, eyeballs deep in in, in trouble with it. Um, I, uh, yeah, my uh, thir 25 year marriage at the time un started to unravel. I, I was doing some, yeah, some stuff that wasn't in my character. I was, anyway, <clears throat> this was, uh, I was looking at uh, eight months in, in prison this last, this was my last time, second last time in jail. So, you know, eight months, that's a long time. I mean, I know guys who do much longer, but for me, it seemed like an eternity. So <clears throat> there I am in jail, and I'm thinking, damn, you know, there was this work camp that I heard about, you know, through, you know, just other guys talking about it. So <clears throat> it was always like I thought, you know, because there was, this prison was one of those ones you could kind of walk around the yard, you know, unsupervised, you could work, make a little money. And I thought, oh, that really, I, that's the kind of time I'd like to do. If I'm gonna be here eight months, I said, I'd like to get in there. But it took me four of those months to get in there finally. And then when I did, <clears throat> I'd realized that you know, there were totem poles in this yard. And uh, as we come in the main gates, there was one that was laying down, it was like old and it was rotting. <clears throat> so I'm like, hmm. so anyway, I was in there, and of course, you run into a few guys that you spent time with in the other prisons. And this one guy in particular, he was kind of this little odd, 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 oddball fellow. And he's, he's like, he goes, "Hey Jerry," he goes, "How are you doing, buddy?" I'm like, "Yeah, good. How are you? Good." And he's like, "Yeah, I told the guard about you." I'm like, "What?" He goes, "Yeah, I told him about your carving." I'm like, "Oh yeah." So anyway. Of course, I run into this guard, and he's like, oh, yeah, I hear you can carve. I'm like, yeah. He goes, uh, well, why don't you carve me something little and uh, let me see what you can do? I'm like, no, no. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, you got a computer? I said, you can go on there and Google my name. I said, you should be able to see what I do. So sure enough, he does that. A couple of days later, I run into him, and he's like, oh, hey, Jerry. How's it going? I'm like, good. And he goes, yeah, I looked you up. I'm like, cool. And he goes, yeah, he goes, he goes, uh, we should talk to the, to the main wardens and stuff and see if we can't get you some, you know, carving going. Because they used to have carving classes, I guess, but because of, you know, guys doing stupid shit with knives. I was just going to say, it seems count counterintuitive in a way, because you, you have to have sharp implements. Yes. Yeah. 
So I guess, you know, a couple of the bad apples back in the day ruined that program. So because they used to have a carving class, guys would carve stuff and then they'd do a, like a little auction. So prisoners were making money a little bit, but I think there were, you know, some jealousy or something going on around there. And yeah, somebody had to screw it up somehow. But anyway, so I got in there. I talked to the main warden and they had already cut down some big tree, like a big, big tree. And they had two, two 20 foot pieces and they'd already used one of them for this carving in another prison back when the carving program was still running. <clears throat> so anyway, I'm looking at these logs. I'm like, I was like, so, hey, you guys want like a total for that spot that's by the gates? I see that one's laying down. It's not, not you know, it's old and rotten. They're like, yeah, let's, you know, let's do this. And then uh, I don't hear anything for a while. So I'm like, okay, well, what's going on here? So I go back and I'm like, so you guys want to pull or not? You know, like I'm running out of time here. I'm not going to be here forever. And they're like, she gets on the phone. She goes to the main warden again. She goes, so do we still want that pull? And they say, yeah. And she hangs up. She goes, yeah. I'm like, great. She goes, there's logs over there. I said, I already picked one, so. Anyway, it's calling me. Yeah. Uh, one of the guards is named Mr. I don't know if I should say his name, but Mr. Godboot. Great guy. Like he's the one that had my back this whole time. And uh, he talked to even the upper main wardens because, uh, again, we're talking knives and stuff. So he had to get their blessing for us to move forward on this. So. Um, his name was Mr. Tosh, and uh, he came in, checked us out, and uh, he uh, gave us his blessing. So they gave me full access to all of the shops because, like, you're only allowed to go to a certain, like, when you first go in there, you got to chop wood. Then you can go to another job. Like, there was forestry where you clean forestry equipment, and then there's a machine shop where you fix tools or fix, like, the lawnmowers and all the other stuff like a uh, mechanic or whatever. Then there was like a landscaping job or, you know, there's all these different jobs. But <clears throat> um, so I got access to everything. So I found this old chainsaw bar, got to cut it into strips, made my knives, made chisels. I made an adz blade, but I needed a handle. So there was this First Nations dude who would come in and he was like our, like we could talk with him, you know, just... I forget, like a counselor or whatever. Anyway, he had he was a canoe builder also, so I, I asked him, I said, would you be able to get me an ads handle? And he's like, oh, yeah, I think I could. So we, again, had to go through through the the wardens and stuff to, to get it for him to bring it in. So sure enough, he brings one in. Um, took me about, I think, a week to make all these tools. And then, uh, yeah, we hauled the log under this big big tent, Quonsum, Quonsum hut or whatever they call them, it was big. Put the log inside and that was, that was my shop and I uh, knocked this pole out in 36 days. They let, they let me work every day. And how did that change your experience of being in prison? It didn't really change, you know, being in prison sucks. There's no ifs, ends or buts about it, you know, like having to live with all these men and sleeping and crapping beside each other, everything. It's, there's nothing pretty about it. But having to carve this pole was something special to me. I thought, wow, you know, like, here I am in jail, doing time, doing what I love. And <clears throat> again, I, I thought, like, like, how lucky am I? And that's kind of where my life started to turn back around. I felt like, you know, all these people that believed in me and, trusted me to do this, you know, like Mr. Tosh was beyond himself too, because he was bringing in politicians and stuff when we did our poll raising, because we carried the poll from the Kwanzaa hut over to its location. We raised it by hand. We had a little barbecue celebration, you know, it was kind of, it was really cool. And we had our, uh, our medicine man came in, did the blessing and everything. And yeah, it was, it was pretty special. And, um, uh, Think about what it meant to you in terms of being feeling like you were seen and valued, but also what a beautiful contribution for other prisoners 
who were arriving and seeing maybe their heritage reflected there. Right. Yeah. And um, fortunately, I, I got to pick my crew, and there was yeah, a couple of native dudes I picked. And, and of course, there was a couple of the big dudes who wanted to be on my crew, and you don't really say no to big guys in jail. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> this way. <laughs> I said, Yeah, you can be on my crew. But they didn't want to carve, they just wanted to be there in the Kwanzaa hut while everybody's outside chopping wood in piss and rain and being all miserable. So he would just sit, these guys would just sit there. <laughs> enjoy. Bodyguards. Yeah, pretty much. So it was all right. And uh, yeah, so, but again, I was having, <clears throat> like before the drug use came, I was having all these crazy dreams about wandering into dark alleys and shady people and and that all kind of came to life when I got into the drugs. And, um, more, more so near the end when I was like, wanting to sober up. So anyway, before the, then, <clears throat> I was having dreams of the logs of carvings, and and it was like, you know, okay, Jerry, you've you know had your fun now, you know, uh, you've reached the bottom of your barrel. I think it's time to come home, you know. Wow. Let me ask you a quick question. Were those, so when you saw the poles in your dreams, were they completed? Some were, some weren't. You know, I was at like some like locations that seemed like there were like piles of logs and some of them again were like starting to carve and all that. And I'm like just crawling on these big logs and having all these ideas like, what am I going to do with this wood? You know, like I'm just, it was really weird dreams, seriously. But nevertheless, yeah, I was like at art shows and galleries, you know, all these guys that I've dealt with had new galleries in different places and yeah, it was just some crazy dreams. But yeah, it seemed like to me, how I interpreted it was carving was calling me home. I said, you know, it's time to come back to her. Back to yourself almost. Yeah. And then that's when my sober, sobriety journey began. And what do you think was the key to your sobriety? Well, first of all, I, the one thing I learned was sobriety has to be for you and you only. You can't do it for anybody else. And, and um, I don't know, I, I, I just felt like I didn't belong there. I felt like there was something more important for me. But the, the hardest part, was my mom <laughs> and, and the look in her eyes when, when I was using, she wouldn't look at me in the eyes. She would talk to me, but she wouldn't look at me in the eyes. And that hurt. It hurt me a lot. I'm sure you could feel her pain, yeah. literally. Yeah, big time. And I feel like you know, I let her down the most. Yeah, but if I may say something, you turned it around. I mean, I remember you were suddenly on the front of a newspaper. She was carving. You were honored, and you took those papers to her. Said, "Mom, check this out." I actually had rough times, but look, I got out of it. I found a lot of good friends there helping me, and together we're doing this. And check this out: yeah. I'm in videos. I'm teaching kids. I'm helping. I'm on the front of newspapers, and I think you said she was very, very proud of you, right? Yeah. Well, again, she eventually started to look me in the eyes again, and and uh, just her love, I guess, was was a huge motivation for me, you know. And then I had my ex-wife too, still talking to me, and she would bring my kids into the conversation, and you know, and of course. <clears throat> It was, you know, again, I like to say you can't do it for anybody else, but, you know, they were huge motivation, you know, my mom, my kids. And, yeah, it was, it was, it was, yeah. And then as soon as, as soon as um, I did get sober, things just started to turn around. And, and again, like I said, Ralph, meeting Ralph, um, 
like the work just hasn't stopped since, you know, like I've been so blessed and fortunate to have pulled myself out of that hole and to have met all of these great people and, and Rolf being at the top of that list. And uh, yeah, to be here to, yeah, survive that because if I had stayed there, there's no way I would be alive right now. No way, it's, it, I was too deep. And the world would have missed out on the beauty that you're creating. That's, that's really profound as well. Um, so it's not just about your loss, but the world's loss, if you had gone down that path. Rolf, um, I know that one of the beautiful spin-offs of the work you've done is that a lot of artists have come here, been part of your initiative, and gotten clean and sober. That happens, yes, and I'm lucky because I actually support geniuses. If you look at Jerry working, and we were fortunate to document this also with some magazines, how he works, he comes in, he looks at a log, and he says, that's a nose, and that's the ear. I'm going, where? He says, well, I know already how it's coming together. He's an incredible talent. He's a visionary. Um, I saw that him right away, and once he started working here, Everybody loved him. And here's the thing. He told me eventually he had some run-ins with the law. And I find and I found today's society is always about judging. And that's very bad. Because everybody at some point may be false. Let's help people up. Eventually, however, and that's the important part, they can do together with the peers and friends and family so, so much. And Jerry is mentoring others. Jerry is a true example how actually reconciliation works in many ways too. And we have many other indigenous artists who really need help. Um, I don't want to criticize the government, but it's often not there. You heard Eric talk the other day. Eric, you know, is out on the streets with many kids helping them. And maybe the government has no money for it, no time, whatever it is. But I think if all of us can come together and create a legacy for our future generations and children, that's most important. And Jerry's doing that. You look at this whole center, there's four huge totem poles, 500 years old, give or take. Other ones, 150 years old, the trees, I mean, and others. And in mass, um, Jerry gives hope to people in so many ways. This is Eric, who spoke Eric too. I like Eric was having rough use. He was on the streets and he became actually a Hollywood actor. And so now he's an actor and a carver. So there's hope. And I think that's the biggest thing I want to take away from this here. It's all about hope. Because today's society, today's world needs hope in many, many ways. But also going to need reconciliation. If we can help people to get back on their feet. And this is also, we had the other day talk about the Gladu Court. Lori Halfman and McCoy talked about that. Um, people fall. Anybody can fall. But... If you get the help to get back on your feet and then you can have a long term sustainable career or do something with it, make a livelihood, that is a very powerful thing. So what we're trying to do here, and Jerry is doing this now, that's what we're especially proud of him. The artists have the option, because we're also land developers, we have the publishing house, we do many things, to trade artwork for land. And Jerry did so many totem poles, he will pick his own piece of land sometime very soon that he can actually start to build on, hold ceremonies on, cut trees, logs, build a house, whatever. And it's by true hope that the next few years and decades, you'll see a large artist community around here in Nova Scotia and Cape Breton coming together, supporting each other also in many, many ways. And um, yeah, Jerry is one of many artists who picked a piece or who's going to pick a piece of land. I think six artists already have, and Jerry also will. And there's beautiful symbolism in that, returning the land to, the, you know, indigenous people. How do you feel about that, Jerry? I think it's, it's an incredible gift that what Ralph offers, you know, the artist that. You know, like, again, I've dealt with many, many people over the years in galleries and, and in BC, you know, that kind of thing. It's just unheard of, you know. So when I heard that Ralph would would do that for a First Nations artist, I was like, "Wow!" Well, I had to ask him about it 
to confirm it was real. Because, <laughs> you know, you hear things and, mm -hmm. you know, I always... But Rolf assured me that that was for real. And I thought, wow. And, uh, yeah, because uh, in BC, uh, to do that, it's impossible for one thing. There's there's no one out there that would offer such, such a, a gift. And then, you know, anyway... The East Coast here is kind of taking over my heart now, so I thought, you know, what what a perfect way to kind of wind down my career you know, to live here. Well, we actually wind it up first before you wind it down. You are such an incredible artist. Um, we'll see. I mean, what you're doing here is so inspiring, and thank you for believing in us and believing in what we do and helping to mentor the other artists also. Um, it's an it's incredible experience. Thank you for that. Thank you. Jerry, I want to ask you one more thing, and that is, you know, you've talked about what it means to you to be here and what it has meant. Um, it strikes me that Rolf is a, an amazing example of an individual. You know, you talk about reconciliation needing to happen at all these different levels, including individuals across Canada. And this is kind of... Uh, an amazing example of that in my mind. Do you see that as as reconciliation, a type of it? I, I feel like, you know, Rolf is taking it upon himself to be in a good example of reconciliation and what it means. Um, I hope that more people can see, because he's mentioned it, you know, why aren't more people like him around Canada? And to me, it's a, it's a, it's a million dollar question. Like, why isn't there more people like him? So I think, you know, Rolf is the epitome of that phrase reconciliation. You know, like, I don't think that was ever his intention to come here and reconciliate with First Nations people, but because it became one of those words that got tossed around to the government. <clears throat> I think Ralph, again, is one of those guys who just leads by action, you know, because talk is cheap and, and um, people need to lead by action you have to show you know you have to act to to really believe somebody you have to see them act you know you have to um, yeah you know what i mean uh, otherwise you know people say a lot of things people talk and talk to me doesn't mean squat unless you know there's some action behind those words yeah and that's, I mean, very much, you know, the, the recommendations that came out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission are split up between acknowledgement and action. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people who say there needs to be a lot more action right now. And we need, you know, those recommendations have to be acted upon and, and go beyond that. Um, Rolf, do you see yourself as the action part of reconciliation in what you're doing? Well, initially not, because I didn't even know there was a necessity for it, right? I didn't know about missing brother women. I did not know about the residential schools. I did not know about children and high suicide rate amongst children. So going forward, I try to listen a lot to people who are in residential school. In fact, many friends of mine were. I understand, I listen. That's really my job to listen. I talk to many people who have families in their life or people in their life missing brother women that were missing, how was the impact? So that's the part we can mourn and we are in many ways, but we can learn from it too. However, I cannot change the past. What I can do, I can do things better for everybody in the future. My point being is I'm so proud and happy to hear that the indigenous, indigenous communities are the fastest growing ones in Canada, but there's a but. And the but is they also have the highest suicide rate among children. That to me is absolutely unacceptable. Um, I have children of my own, now two grandkids, such a joy to grow them up. And thinking for one second 
they will take their life because they have no, I don't know, no future. They have, they have nothing there. Um, maybe also because their parents were in residential school, their grandparents, and so therefore everything was dif difficult in terms of family and support. Again, you know me, I never judge ever. This was Jay's legacy left to us. Jay Barrett, where he said, do not judge one another before he passed away. So I just don't judge, but I'm trying to listen and to help. And I truly hope and they can see how what we have here has an incredible impact on indigenous families, anybody for that matter, to give them hope, indigenous or not, and how it helps to guide the young generation better and our children. And that's, I think, what really people should take away from this. And it's kind of what Jerry said, Many people talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. And I'm not, again, criticizing that. I just see it, including governments. And by the way, globally, many indigenous people globally, in whatever country, don't stand much of a chance these days, right? So listening, then acting, and doing it together is really, to me, the powerful experience and the joy you can see in people's eyes. Sandra Simon had not done queer baskets in quite some time because people wouldn't support this art or wouldn't pay enough money. So we asked her to start doing queer baskets again, which she did. Then we bought her a vehicle and she f drove from First Nations community to community and taught the children. And she tears in her eyes. She was that happy to be able to pass this on. Then she passed away. She was like a dear friend and mother to us. Um, but she left this legacy for the next generation. And that's, I think, what's going to happen in all these artworks, the paintings, but the total pose too. People are going to say 50, 100 years from now, I wonder who was Jerry Sheena? I wonder who was Jerry Redbird? I wonder who was Loretta Gould? And Loretta didn't want to paint. I mean, we had to beg her to paint. I remember, I said, please paint. She and like she didn't want to a paint. Broken record. <laughs> um, but she did. And now you go to the airport in Halifax, they have a display 400 feet by 8 feet one of the largest one in Canada, this is in 10 years, where she all started doing this. Um, there has to be hope. This week, as you know, we asked for these talks. We asked all kinds of people, the basis of the artists, but we asked many organizations. We asked former premiers, different parties to come together in friendship and peace to say this is important. Um, we asked senators, we asked our dear friend, brother, Stephen Augustine, who works at CBU, to come and you met him, of course, several times, and so on and so forth. So it's about friendship, family, heart, helping one another, not judging at any point in time. Um, and when people fall, help them up. Now, it's sometimes difficult for me to do all this because I do it alone in terms of financing that. And we have always done that because I do not want the government or anybody who gets involved and then say, we gave you, we gave you. you. know, the artist has an obligation. This is what Jerry says. We need the artist to feel free of any duties or whatever there might be. And the artist can work now. So when they have a problem or a question, they come to me, I can address it usually and help. If you have all kinds of other people in terms of funding in there, I might have to ask the government, can we do this and that? And we rather do things in small steps the way we can do it rather than big. But again, when the funding dries up, it falls apart. That doesn't mean the government is bad, of course not. But I would like to work with everybody, and especially it comes into parties, whatever they are, liberals, conservatives, or NDP, whatever the, all these parties are. Um, we really don't care. We want people to talk from the heart. And you saw Ian Rankin talk from his heart. You see Roddy McDonald talk from his heart yesterday in Christmas. Dan just spoke from his heart. And today you have Roddy McDonald and Steve McNeil coming in and talking about this in friendship about how we can work more on reconciliation. And I, I feel grateful to them that they're seeing this coming, taking action, helping. Anyways, to make a long story short, like reconciliation has to come from the heart. And sometimes it's for me difficult to fund all this alone. And COVID-19 made it difficult for us. Um, then the government had imposed a new tax, which really would have killed everything, but they changed their mind about the tax, so that was good. Um, so we're just doing things small steps, but we do what we can do with what we have, right? Well, it's extraordinary what you've done and how much you've put into it, Rolf. 
I wonder if you can give me one word to represent what you get out of it. Love. Mm. A lot of love comes back. Yeah. And hope. That too. Jerry, do you have one word to represent what you have gotten out of your relationship with Friends United? Well, I'd say friendship, but I mean, just because uh, of the name of this place, Friends United, you know, friendship. I got amazing friendships there. Um, but, you know, the love Rolf spreads around like we spread jam on toast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's, I think that's a pretty great way to end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rolf. Thanks for having us. <laughs>